Hello, I'm Rosemary Hill and I'm a member of English Heritage's Blue Plaques panel and I'm very happy to be here on World Town Planning Day to celebrate our latest Blue Plaque to the pioneer of town planning, Sir Patrick Abercrombie. The Blue Plaque scheme was founded in 1866 and as far as we know it is the oldest scheme of its kind in the world. It was started by the Society of Arts and in just over 150 years its history has pretty much mirrored the vicissitudes of London government. From the Society of Arts it went to the care of the London County Council which of course turned into the Greater London Council which was then abolished and from there it came to English Heritage and it's now entirely supported by private donations and those donors always receive our greatest thanks for making possible one of the most enjoyable and one of the most accessible of heritage enterprises. It doesn't cost anything to see a blue plaque. Blue plaques mark the addresses of the famous, sometimes the unjustly forgotten, occasionally the mildly notorious of London. And I think when you see a blue plaque in the street it's like seeing a beacon because each plaque is at the same time familiar, they all take the same form and yet each is unique. It's like a kind of TARDIS because inside each one there is a different and important story. The plaques mark the physical fabric of London. They tell us about the places where important things happened, where remarkable people lived and also indirectly they tell us the story of our streets. So perhaps it's a bit surprising this is the first plaque to have a reference to town planning on it. But then, of course, Abercrombie was one of the first people, arguably the first, to merit that professional description. He began his working life as an architect, and he joins a distinguished list of architects who have tried to replan London and failed. Christopher Wren and John Nash both had visions which, though London rejected them as a whole, have left great legacies, not just Wren St Paul's, but his many city churches. And from Nash's unrealised vision of Regency London, we have Regent Street, we have All Souls Langham Place, and we have the picturesque glories of Regent's Park. Abercrombie, like Wren after the Great Fire, was asked to consider post-war London as almost a tabula rasa. But England is not France, and the Grand Projet is seldom adopted. And the piecemeal and the comfortable muddle of the familiar is generally allowed to survive. So Abercrombie's Greater London Plan of 1945 was not carried out in its totality and the arguments about what should or should not be done with it went on for 20 years at least after his death, well into the 1970s. There are perhaps not many people today who wish that the plan had been realised in full, but its legacy for the capital and its surroundings, which is with us still, in the statutory protection of the Greenbelt, in the blossoming of eight new towns, was benign and visionary. Another of Abercrombie's ventures was the, his founding role in the Council for the Protection of Rural England, because he understood that the town is nothing without the country, and vice versa. It was a lesson he perhaps took from William Morris, the getter of the arts and crafts movement, who Abercrombie admired. He, like Morris, was an idealist. His colleague Gerald Dix described him as the world's foremost prophet of town and country planning, and prophets, as we know, are not always honoured or even very much respected. Only last month in The Guardian, Simon Jenkins was lamenting the flaws in the Greater London Plan and blaming Abercrombie himself rather too much, I think, for what happened to his ideas. So it's particularly satisfying to turn the focus back towards his achievements at this building where he was living when he took up his post as Professor of Town Planning at University College. It was from here that he um, lived throughout the peak of his career. It was from here that he produced the County of London Plan in 1943 and then the Greater London Plan. And I want to conclude just by thanking once again all the donors who make the Blue Plaques possible. Also the property's owners, without whom of course we cannot uh, put up a Blue Plaque and to the Royal Town Planning Institute and their present president, Ian Tant, who's joining us in the commemoration of Patrick Abercrombie. Thank you, Rosemary. Um, as town planners, uh, like all professions, um, we have uh, our foundations uh, and we have uh, the development of the profession, um, a tribute to the great thinkers uh, and the actors who brought town planning into play. Uh, in town planning, the names that are most often referred to are Ebenezer Howard, Patrick Geddes, 
and Sir Patrick Abercrombie. Sir Patrick Abercrombie, uh, as we know, was an architect who first uh, started uh, thinking on turning his attention to town planning in his time at the University of Liverpool, uh, where he founded the first planning school in the country. In due course, Sir Patrick went on to make an enormous contribution to planning practice. Uh, his great achievements include uh, the production of the Greater London Plan of 1944, uh, leading the reshaping of London and its surrounding region, uh, many aspects of which uh, we still follow 50 or more years later. Uh, the foremost planning educator of recent years, Sir Peter Hall, described Patrick Abercrombie as an architect in every sense of the post-war planning system. He was a writer, a thinker and a practitioner. As president of the Royal Town Planning Institute and a chartered town planner, I know that my career would not have been possible without the work before me of Sir Patrick Abercrombie. Um, I'm delighted to be here at the dedication of the blue plaque uh, on the 70th anniversary of World Town Planning Day, uh, recognising Sir Patrick's enormous contribution to London, to the United Kingdom and to town planning as a profession around the world. Um, we have this morning received the following message uh, from Sir Patrick Abercrombie's surviving grandchild, uh, Fiona Abercrombie Howroyd. Uh, she's now based in Tasmania, Australia. And Fiona writes, I hope you will indulge me making a few quick comments from far-flung Hobart on this wonderful day. In 2005, when the Royal Town Planning Institute commemorated my grandfather's plans for London, I had cause to observe that Patrick Abercrombie was a man for his times when prescribing the meta-narratives of urban planning made possible largely due to, due to two world wars and their resultant socio-economic upheavals. Uh, thankfully, we do not have the same opportunities today. Instead, we as planners must satisfy ourselves with attempting to make productive contributions at the margins of government, and the margins of industry, and in our own communities. I question what Pat Abercrombie would make of how we live our lives today in these new and very different circumstances. Recently, I found a recording of Patrick talking at the Hobart City Town Hall during his post-war tour of Australia in 1948. He talked about how we make our cities vital places that include green belts, cycle and walkways, and transport hubs to facilitate our work and play. I was struck by the thought that nothing actually has changed at all. This is what we as planners still aspire to do. I think if he were here today, he would suggest that we will continue to aspire as there can be nothing more important than how we live, work and play in our communities and ever increasingly our environment. My father Neil, Patrick's beloved son and an eminent planner in his own right, married his beautiful Australian bride Marjorie after the war and brought her to London in the summer of 1952. Marjorie loved to tell stories of her arrival in London in 1952 and being greeted very enthusiastically by Pat at his house. She was swept up in a world of lectures, public events, concerts, functions, embassies, clubs, parties and family gatherings. She never forgot her stay in, this, in the house in London uh, with Pat and Neil. My father talked to her often too. I would like to thank the Blue Black Organisation and the RTPI for this commemoration of 63 Edgerton Gardens. I do this on behalf of my late father Neil, Patrick's late daughter Deborah, my late cousin Susanna, and finally my late sister Caroline. I do this with incredible pride. And thank you, Fiona, for that message. Reverend, thank you very much. Thank you. It's wonderful to have a plaque to a town planner on a building here in the United Kingdom. Thank you.